This is fantastic. It's great to see everyone here. Um, it's a little bit after 12 noon Eastern, so we're just going to go ahead and start. Um, this session is being recorded. Um, my name is Suman Kapoor. I am CEO of Well Balanced Solutions, and I'm here with my co-host and dear friend, Tiffany Castaño, CEO of Sefer. Um, and we have our guest here, Sultana Karim. Uh, but before we get into our topic today, I wanted to do just a really quick housekeeping, uh, I, some housekeeping items. Um, the first is to remind you with the fact that this is a short month with our Thanksgiving holiday. So we will, we will have our unrecorded session next week, the 20th, and we will not be getting together on the 27th of this month. Uh, we'll pick up again in December and we will not be meeting on December 25th. Um, and so with all that, Tiffany, anything else you wanted to add before we jump in? I think just uh, we'd like to remind everyone that we, uh, as Simon said, we're obviously recording. We thank you all for being here on Team Live and Team Replay. Whoever's going to watch afterwards, feel free to use the chat function and or to unmute if you're not comfortable being on camera because we are recording and we do repost these on YouTube and other social media. Uh, feel free to, to have that off. The other piece is that we do try to stick around for at least 10 to 15, maybe 20 minutes afterwards, after we're done recording for those of you who are with us live and um, we can just chat. Uh, feel free to turn your cameras on at that time if that works for you. And otherwise, I'm excited to get started. Perfect. Well, I would love to introduce everyone to Sultana Karim. Sultana is a licensed counselor in the state of Maryland and Virginia and is a certified clinical trauma professional. She has a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in counseling psychology. She's currently a stay-at-home mom to an adorable little girl, um, and she works part-time at Postpartum Support Virginia as the Director of Community, Out Community Resources and Fit for Mom in Lorton, Springfield, Burke, Woodbridge, and Kingstown as the Fit for Baby Program Manager and Instructor. Sultana's facilitated support groups for pregnant and postpartum women for these organizations and businesses. Additionally, she has years of experience provide, providing counseling to children, adolescents, adults, and families with a variety of emotional and behavioral issues with a specialization in treating survivors of sexual and domestic violence. Um, I'd love, Sultana, for you to start with what got you into this field? What got you here doing the work that you are doing? Um, well, like Simon mentioned, so I'm a woman of color. Um, my, I have a one-year-old um, who will be two in December. It's too sad, but <laughs> happy, but sad. But um, I am a Bengali first generation and African-American. Um, I struggled with PMADS during my pregnancy as well as postpartum, and I had a traumatic birth experience. So my journey through that with getting treatments, going to support groups kind of motivate me to kind of do the work I'm doing right now because there weren't a lot of providers that were women of color that provided support for other women of color. Um, and also this topic kind of relates to my own family system of being Bengali as well as African-American. Um, when I struggled with PMADS, they were often saying like, oh, what do you have to be sad about? You have a healthy baby at least you have a healthy baby, oh, go pray about it or it'll go away. And these are comments that women of color hear in a variety of different settings, not only their family of origin. Yep. And so if I could just interject a quick question, can you, you use the term PMADS. Can you talk to me a little bit or tell our audience what PMADS stand for? Yes, PMADS stands for Perinatal Mood and Anxiety Disorders. Um, they consist of depression, anxiety, um, postpartum anger, uh, bipolar disorder, um, post-traumatic stress disorder. On the severe end, you have a psychosis. And on the other end is baby blues, which is often more so talked about than perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Got it. Perfect. So we're excited to Perfect. hear the, what you've got going on and what your research has shown you. Perfect. So I do want to make a disclaimer as I do my presentation. I will use the term women of color throughout my presentation. This presentation will not cover every single disparity for each category of women of color because the 
the term is so broadly, it's just a broad topic to kind of compiles everybody who are different or who are not white, essentially. <laughs> um, but my presentation will focus on um, commonalities and disparities among women of color overall. Okay, <laughs> so let's go into statistics. Um, so a lot of the statistics that I'm gonna talk about um, is from several research, including from CDC, Icon School of Medicine, and uh, Sai Ni. Um, there's just a lot of different researches that talked about um, women of color as well as black women. So one of them is three, a one in three black women will struggle with PMADs. Women of color have a higher risk of developing PMADs than white women. Um, black women are not screened for PMADs as often as white women. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about these stats later on. Um, Common screening tools for perinatal mood anxiety disorder doesn't accurately assess for symptoms in women of color. And I'll go more detail later on about that. 60% of women of color do not receive proper treatment or support for PMADs. And black women are two to three times more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than white women. And I always like to um, have some type of a visual aid. Somebody show a chart from the CDC. So they did a study between 2006, 2006 to 2017 that looked at racial disparities in pregnant women and um, pregnant mortality. So let me share this. Share it. Oh, hold on a I need to move you guys out of the area. Um, so as you look at this chart, you can see if you have a black woman who has higher level education uh, past grads or past um, college, who has at least a bachelor's degree or higher, they are higher risk of more likely to die than a white woman who's either have like a high school education or less than. So that's significant as you look through here. Um, the light, the dark blue, uh, the, yeah, the dark blue is white women. The dark purple is black women, and then the light purple is um, is um, um, American Indian and Alaska Native. So that kind of gives you a picture of like what the disparity is here. Any questions before I continue? I gotta say that visual was uh, was pretty shocking. Um, you know, I'm familiar. Sultana and I actually worked together at Postpartum Support Virginia, and while I'm familiar with these stats, every time I see that chart or every time I hear these statistics, it's it's shocking um, and scary. So the more we talk about it, and the more work that gets done in this arena, my hope and goal is to equalize that and that women of color will get the medical attention that they need. Let's go into disparities. So there's a bunch of disparities. I'm going to tackle each one <laughs> as I go through. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is socioeconomic status. Um, so women of color may not have financial resources or be able to take time off to be able to um, go to health appointments or see a mental health provider. Um, sometimes they can't afford the services and there's also income inequalities as we think of our system overall, um, how it was initially created. It was off the backs of slave men and women. Um, that's a different story for a different time. <laughs> um, medical care. Uh, so when we talk about mental health, we can't not talk about health overall. Um, and medical care plays an essential role when we talk about disparities. Um, so for medical care, some women of color do not have access to quality medical care from providers, or um, they have limited care. So the, let's say they, prior to pregnancy, they didn't have health insurance. And now that they're pregnant, they have that health insurance to the duration of the labor and delivery of their baby. Some uh, providers, let's say a mom um, 
disclose, hey, I'm feeling X, Y, and Z about this pregnancy, um, oftentimes providers will minimize what the symptoms are, say, oh, you know, that's preg- that's normal pregnancy symptoms instead of thoroughly asking more questions about that. Um, oftentimes provider have a certain perception of women of color. So for example, if we have a black a woman who goes in to see her doctor and try to advocate for herself, oftentimes she will be seen as like the mad black woman just for advocating for herself. Um, and speaking of black women, there's a, and well, people of color, specifically black women who are descendants of slaves, there is a mistrust in the medical system. Another disparity is exposure to trauma. So traumas, including childhood traumas, emotional, sexual, um, physical abuse, abandonment, neglect, um, domestic sexual uh, violence as an adult. Um, all of these are risk factors for developing um, PMADs. Another disparity is the way that women of color describe their symptoms. Oftentimes, they're not going to say, I feel sad because X, Y, and Z. They're more likely to report that I feel fatigue, I have stomach aches, I have a headache, I feel like I'm going crazy, what's going on with me? Um, And when we talk about the culture component about it, one, um, not all cultures talk about feelings because it's seen as a weakness. And two, certain languages do not have the words to specifically explain certain feelings. The next disparity is being screened. Um, like I mentioned in my statistics, uh, oftentimes black women and women of color are not often thoroughly screened for PMADs. That res- results in less follow-ups from providers getting the care that they need, as well as not educating them on the symptoms to be aware of and giving them permission to talk about those because uh, it might not have otherwise been brought up either out of shame or the lack of awareness. Um, with women not being women of color not being screened, um, it's um, essentially is undiagnosed, it's untreated PMADs, which can be deadly because suicide is a leading cause of maternal death for women who experience postpartum depression. Um, untreated PMADs uh, impacts the health and well-being of the woman and her family, but also if we look at the long-term consequences of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral development of the child. So it's a significant impact when it's not addressed and it impacts pretty much that child throughout their life. So Sultana, we have a question in the chat and I don't know if you'll talk about this further down um, in your presentation, but someone says, our perceptions, misperceptions can be our, our undoing. How can we begin to change this? Education, awareness, this is a habitual issue as well that many of us are not aware of, sad. Yes, I'll cover that. (laughs) Perfect. Yes. (laughs) I figured you would. (laughs) Yes. Because, yeah. (laughs) So I will table that for now. (laughs) Um, Let me go into more disparities. As we talk about stress due to racism, oppression, and systematic racism, another thing that we don't talk about is generational trauma that comes along with all of that, that is passed on from one generation to the next. Um, so the reason why like black women do not seek follow-up treatment is deeply rooted into the systematic racism and the legacy of slavery that continue in modern medicine. Because when we think of modern medicine, how it's developed, um, black slaves were treated pretty much like cattle and were experimented on. And that's how we have what we have. And that's why there's a mistrust in the medical system. Um, there's several different experiments that happen um, where people were, slaves were experimented on. And I'll go into a little detail about that a little bit later as well. Um, So as a result, some black women mistrust the medical system. They worry about talking about their feelings of depression, especially to a professional, because they are afraid that child welfare will be involved and their children will be taken or they'll be judged as a bad parent. And when you think about kind of going back into history, um, children, children of slaves were taken away from them. And those who weren't taken away from them, um, they tend to not not teach their children a lot because if if their their slave owner noticed that, oh, well, this child is very smart, that's another 
another aspect of how um, another another way that their child can be taken away. Essentially, <laughs> um, another disparity is a lack of support throughout. So, lack of support from family, partners, um, church, within one culture, because um, there are specific stigma and ignorance amount around mental illness. Mental illness is often seen as a taboo and admitting that you have mental illness will either for one culture will bring shame upon to a family or it will be seen as weakness. Oftentimes seeking counseling and therapy is seen as a luxury that not, it's not for everybody. Um, the perception that uh, for black women, you have to be the strong mom. So if you're strong, you're not developing postpartum depression. You're not admitting to the fact that you're depressed and being viewed as an unfit mother. Uh, emphasis in, in, when we talk about all women of color is on silence when you're struggling, take care of everyone else but yourself, turn to religion and efforts to overcome your struggle, be strong in the face of adversity regardless of what the adversity is. As for church, um, stigma around church, um, oftentimes um, the black community will often hear People say, give it to God when they're struggling, whether it's mental health or really any struggles that they have. Um, often in a church, there's not people to talk to about Ill mental illness. Um, they're told that their struggles are due to the result of not living right, not being married. You need to be a better Christian, pray harder, serve more, good things will happen. But that's not always the case. Um, I did read an article, it's called Postpartum Depression While Black. It talked about how the author was experiencing um, depression, anxiety, both during her pregnancy and postpartum and having the internal battle with herself because culturally for her, seeking mental health services was not something black people did. Um, and I'm, just, I'm gonna read an excerpt from it um, that I thought was very impactful in terms of her processing. She said, the stigma is unbearable. Who wants everyone to think that they are not a good parent? Who wants their black peers to know that they're the weakling of the bunch? How are we to raise, how are we raised to be strong women, black women, but still can't get our lives together? Who wants to tell their faith community that now they're questioning their relationship with God? Because you've been praying nonstop and nothing has changed for you. No one wants to admit that, but that's the reality. Um, so for South Asian communities, um, children are thought to be the pinnacle of their achievement. So the only feeling that you should have is joy when you have a child. Um, they are expected to kind of perform certain tasks. So you're have to be nurturing, you have to transmit your tradition, you have to uphold honor. And a lot of South Asian communities that um, uh, that believe in Hinduism look at their goddesses. So their goddesses are often worshiped as unravely devotion to their husbands and children. And that's the expectation when we have for moms is you're devoted to your family. And if you try to seek help for yourself, then you're not a good mother. Um, another disparity is emotional factors, um, not emotional factors, environmental factors. What am I talking about? <laughs> okay, Sultana, can I, inter can I interject just a moment? Yes. Um, I think the other, speaking as a South Asian, the other is adding the in-laws into the equation here. Um, South Asian families tend to live with their in-laws. So the, the women get married and then move into their husband's families and they're expected to take care of their in-laws. So when you have a child, that doesn't stop anything. Mm -hmm. it ex you are still expected to get up, cook the breakfast, clean the house, take care of your in-laws, um, as well as take care of the babies. So there is work in the South Asian community to also change that dynamic and conversation because if I was a if I was the mother-in-law, I went through that same thing that my daughter-in-law is going through. So I should understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so that conversation needs to change as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
And that just puts more pressure on that mom who's already struggling emotionally, don't have necessarily the words to articulate those things. It's just, it's just hard. <laughs> um, so for environmental factors where a woman of color may live can, can tend to be unsafe or be in rural areas. Um, they could also have a lack of local resources. So if they're living in a rural area and the local, the closest hospital is an hour away, that's a barrier in itself of not having care closer or even quality care at that. Um, racial and uh, gender discrimination in the workplace is often lead to fear of disclosing PMADs or the, even indicating that you need help because there's a fear that if you say that you are weak, your supervisor or your employer, that you might lose your job. Any questions or thoughts about the disparities? So we do have a question in here. It says, what can partners do to help? I'll get, I'll go through that. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. But we actually had a, a lot of good comments in here. Um, so let me just scroll up a little bit. Someone put in here, uh, like my good friend says, you need Jesus and a therapist. Um, <laughs> and so I think that also is kind of moving, is shifting the idea where you solely put in, you know, put it, place everything on God and religion. Um, and then she says, black communities are solely getting there but the historic trauma is real and the strong black woman myth is literally killing us. Yep, 100%. Yep, perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna slightly change gears a little bit and talk about barriers in mental health care. Um, first, the cost of care is pretty high, even if you have public and private insurance, especially if you don't have insurance, because if you think about a standard therapy session is about what, $150 per hour. Not everybody can afford that and that certain groups of people can. So something to think about. Um, a lack of providers in a person's community. So not having providers of, that matches the community in which is being served. Um, a cultural belief that mental health doesn't work and that lack of historical mistrust of the medical system. Since mental health care is a part of the me medical system, it's still, it, it still creates a barrier for people to want to seek a therapist or a counselor to get the help that they need. A mental health care system in which providers lack cultural competency and do not have an understanding of values and cultural practices of diverse people of color may, that they might hold. Um, it is more, so when people say like, oh, well, I'm cultural competent and um, with understanding black people and South Asian people and all of that, and I know a few facts, that's just because you know a few facts doesn't mean that you're understanding a person's culture. Uh, due to the complexity of multiculturalism, it's beneficial to look at cultural competency as a process rather than the end all. Um, this is where like the term cultural humidity plays a role in which it, it is described as a, con a construct of understanding and developing a process-oriented approach to competency. Um, there's a lifelong commitment to self-evaluation and self-critique. Um, it is desire to fix power imbalances, essentially meaning recognizing that each person brings something to the table um, and it's valued. So like if you're in a therapy situation where you're the therapist, you know, understand theories and, beha and human behavior, but your client understands their culture, they lived it, they have their own experiences, which then can enrich the information that you have. And it should be a collaborative process. Um, developing partnership with people and groups who advocate for others. Another barrier is stigma about mental health. Um, both among and about community of colors. So essentially what, how our system in mental health care is serving, what, how we're serving people, but also how the stigmas of black people are perceived or South Asian women perceived or really any women of color. There's often a language barrier. So there's not a lack of providers who can provide adequate care or uh, a person of color who speaks another language. 
Um, there's also race, race, uh, sorry, races and bias and discrimination in treatment settings, and then the lack of resources. So lack of resources, including lack of transportation, childcare, pay leave, and time off. And even if someone has all of these, uh, these resources, they may not be accessible to it due to the obstacles that they may face. I'm gonna stop here and see if anybody has any questions. So there's a comment in the chat that says, hearing all of this, it sounds like women of color have more emotional expectations put on them is greater than white women. Don't know I've ever looked at it this way. This is why these conversations are important. Exactly. Absolutely. Yes. Um, and I also think even if you have the resources, financial resources, so you live in places where you are have, access, you have accessibility to doctors and hospitals and you make all your appointments and you do all your prenatal care and you're highly educated based on the color of your skin, I think mm -hmm. when you walk into a OBGYN's office, those biases come into the forefront of thinking. Um, and so even, um, I think there was this woman a couple of months ago over the summer in New York, a young mom, uh, I believe her last name was Washington, uh, Shaisha maybe was her first name. And she died um, from complications of, um, from an emergency C-section highly educated. She was excited about having her baby. She went to all of her prenatal appointments um, and the doctors dismissed her concerns and she kept going in there and saying, I, something's not feeling right, something's not feeling right. So as women were told to go with your gut instincts, but then on the opposite, when we do, we're hitting, we're, we basically are hitting a wall. Um, mm -hmm. And I truly believe it's because of the color of our skin. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And that's so. why we see the high rates of women of color dying more, more likely dying from complications that are, that are simple to fix, but it's not. And they're dying because of it. Yeah. It's, it's heartbreaking. To it sleep. is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And you'll hear, and, and if you have the opportunity at some point to read the chat, it's, you're, that's exactly what you're hearing. Um, says I'm completely blown away by how many disparities there are. And I already knew there were some, so many, wow. Um, even Serena Williams had to fight for her life. That's right. Um, hmm. and, the and the hospital staff to treat her properly after birth. She was one of the most well-known women in the world known to have blood clotting disorder and they ignored her requests until she was obstinate about her care. Exactly, mm -hmm. I totally forgot about Serena Williams and why I did, don't know. Um, yes, I've had to basically bring a dissertation into the doctor's office as to why I wanted a certain treatment. I have also had to switch doctors multiple times to feel heard and seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same story. I can relate to many stories that have been typed in here. Exactly. Yes, and it's still happening despite all the information that's out there. <sighs> it's, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, it says you're caught between a rock and a heart place, a total vicious cycle shit show. Excuse my language, but yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's you. transition to like, what can we do, right? So first thing is addressing the conditions in which people of color live in and work in. Um, this is not something that an individual person can do solely. I think this is beyond, this is what policymakers and advocates can address the inequalities, but we can contribute to that by the way we vote. Who do we vote for? Knowing what their objective is. Um, I know here in Prince William County, we have board of supervisor meetings that talk about the budget for the county. Going to those meetings and seeing what's happening. Are we focusing the money on women of color or people who have her, who are not able to access resources? Are we giving the money to those people and organizations that are helping those people or us? <laughs> um, support expanding um, health care for mom and babies. Like I mentioned earlier, oftentimes women who do not have health insurance prior to pregnancy will get Medicaid. Um, during their pregnancy up to uh, labor and delivery of their baby. And then oftentimes it's best end of their services. Um, it would be beneficial if they had um, care throughout 
the postpartum period because statistically speaking, women of color do show symptoms of PMAT, perinatal mood anxiety disorders, three months, six months, up to year past the time they deliver their baby. So how are we actually accessing those services for them so they're actually getting help that they need? Another thing is educating mothers about uh, potentially developing certain illnesses and including PMADs. So I think our medical system does a great job with talking about, for example, gestational diabetes and the process, but not necessarily the best job is talking about PMADs. Um, oftentimes providers will just give moms assessments, but they're not explaining what it is, why they're making that assessment, what symptoms that they need to be aware of, talking about their score and assessment. So this is a follow-up what the score means, regardless if it's a high or low score, and then what does treatment mean for them? Um, providing culturally and linguistic appropriate care. So this is going back to when I talk about cultural humidity. Um, so to provide cultural appropriate care, we need to understand our own culture and how our culture affects our relationship with our clients. Um, do our biases, do we have biases related to our client's culture? Um, have we done our own work in understanding how our, our culture plays a role in forming our relationships with clients, but also our perspective of the world? Um, do you understand the privileges that you have and that someone may not? Do you understand what microaggressions are? I have recently talked to a friend who's been practicing for over 20 years, and she didn't know what microaggressions were. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and she's a mental health provider. Um, so I had to explain like microaggression. So example of microaggression is someone saying, oh, you're pretty, pretty for a black girl. <laughs> Just phrases like that, that kind of minimizes a person. Um, also in terms of what we can do is advocating for policy change. So like I was mentioning earlier about addressing the condition, knowing what is happening with the policies within the area you live in, as well as if we talk about federally, um, know what um, what money is being spent on, how is it impacting people of different cultures, because decision makers can have an impact um, on advancing equality and closing disparity gaps. And I think disparity also is the education that we have. Um, very stem from, like I was mentioning earlier about obstetrician care um, and their education stems from slavery. So understanding and knowing that and acknowledging that is the past. Because a lot of people don't understand or even know of kind of the history of that, of racism and the development of different programs. Because a lot of programs do not Okay, some programs, let me rephrase that. Some programs don't necessarily focus on like culture. Um, da, da, da. Supporting um, women of color led organizations and groups. This either can be within your profession. So for example, um, Postpartum Support International, they have a women of color um, alliance that focuses on problems and issues for women of color and as well as advancing providers who would like to learn about perinatal mood anxiety disorders who are women of color, um, as well as uh, working and ensuring access to mental health care and maternal justice. We want to try to build a strong long-term relationship and respectful relationship in order to advance a racial equality in healthcare. So supporting programs such as Sister Song, um, Black Mamas Matter, the Center for Reproductive Rights, uh, Every Mom Counts, Common Sense Birth, Changing Women Initiative, all of these programs, and there's so much, so many more that are focused on reproductive justice and, um, and health care for women of color. And then depending on where, like the type of environment or work that you have, um, hiring and retaining staff that reflects the diversity needs of the community and the population that is served. So that means adapting equitable um, hiring practices, ensuring that staff is compensated fairly and build pathways for staff to advance in their career. Um, 
Um, I'm going to open it up for any questions before I talk a little bit more. <laughs> yep. So there are a couple of questions. Um, let me just scroll back up here. So um, this is going back to um, the moms dying. Uh, it says, are, there di are they dying more often because they're not taken seriously up front when, when they might feel something is amiss and potential problems could be addressed when they should be? Or they are provided a different standard of care once things really go awry? That's a really good question. Um, in terms of medical care, um, and I'm gonna go very generalistic because it's, mm -hmm. that's just the way this. <laughs> um, oftentimes when we talk about women of color, they, tend, they are often not heard when they are saying, or they're advocating for themselves related to the symptoms that they're having. Oftentimes physicians would kind of generalize based on their ethnic group. So I recently uh, went to a conference that um, had a obstetrician who talked about how there is not enough time in her appointments to sit down and have a conversation with each and every patient that she has. She has like a 15 minute window to get as much information as she can. And a lot of the information that she tells her clients are based on her own perception of that person and what she learned in her studies about, let's say, Black women. So, um, for example, Black women can potentially have uh, or be receptive of sickle cell disease. So she will often give a treatment or assess for sickle cells when the mom is pregnant. Even if, let's say, the mom historically, like in their background, there's no one that has sickle cell disease. I think I answered a question, yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Just scroll down here. So another question, I know, I know you'll probably get to the partner, what partners can do to help, but here's a question. Do you have a breakdown of disparities data based on relationship status? That's an interesting question. I do not, but that is a very good yeah. question. Yeah, maybe we can get back to, mm -hmm. do a little bit of research and get back to this question um, down the road. We can post something about the answer to this question, but that's a really interesting question, what the data shows out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that fathers, um, if a mom is exhibiting symptoms of PMADS, there is a likelihood that the uh, father may exhibit some symptoms, especially if it's like a traumatic birth that may have an impact as well. Mm -hmm. But I don't have statistical information at this point to be able to fully answer that question. Great. All right, I think we're good. You can go on. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, there was a question that was asked me um, previously when I've done this presentation and they asked, what can I as a private practice mental health provider do in the face of all the diversity that you're talking about and the uh, lack of mental health care and the barriers that women of color face? And my first response was, you need to educate yourself um, because it's not up to the client to educate you based on culture and your own biases. Um, two is when you look at your own practice and how you do things, are you coming from putting the lens on of how am I being anti-racist? Um, so do you have like an anti-discrimination policy in your, um, in your practice? Um, when do you what do you notice about the people you serve? Are you serving certain groups of people? That's something to consider. Um, uh, do you ask the people you serve what, how they identify themselves instead of assuming, oh, because someone is a brown skin that they must be black. Um, so really having that dialogue and understanding as well as when you do your assessment tools or information gathering that you get from your clients. Um, for example, where it says race, you can do classifications like black, um, Asian, yada, 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 but also put an other box. So just in case they, they, don't, they don't necessarily identify as classifications that you have, they can specifically describe that and have that conversation with them afterwards of what that means for them. 
Um, also look at how your waiting room is set up. Um, do your, does your um, content in your waiting room have women of colors? For example, like magazines, does it show women of color in your magazines or is it just white women? <laughs> Just things like that. I do have resources that I would like to share, but before I keep on going, um, any other questions about my little? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I know that, I, I don't know if I missed hearing it, but do you have specific um, response to the question about what partners can do to help moms who are struggling, even, whether it's prenatal or postpartum? I think that partners can be an advocate for um, their partner. Um, let's say they've noticed when the mom or their partner is interacting with their primary their care provider, and noticing that there's something's not not happening or they're not being heard. The partner can also step in and say, like, well, this is what's happening. She's telling you that X, Y, and Z is happening, and we believe. Because we want the partner to be an ally and an advocate just in case the mom, either she she is advocating for herself or she's not. I think the essence of that is that both partners need to be educated on what's happening in what's happening uh, in their appointments, but also the effects of um, labor, what's that going to look like? Because I oftentimes, I, well, so I've done a lot of different presentations in which um, they talk about how women of color and really people of color overall are not necessarily educated on the process of um, pregnancy, but also what to expect during the birthing experience, labor, delivery, what's that going to look like, as well as the good things and the bad things that can happen. Because oftentimes people are like, oh, I experienced a traumatic birth because I was expecting to, you know, just give birth naturally, but I had to have an emergency C-section because my baby was breached and I didn't know that was what was that was going to happen and I didn't know what was going like what was happening at the time because the doctors are so fast at um, doing everything and not explaining what was going on. So having another person, whether it's a partner or your doula, just advocate for you and explain what's going on can help. Um, so there's another question here. What are some of the unhealthy coping mechanisms of women experience postpartum trauma? That's a good question. <laughs> so unhealthy coping mechanisms can be resulting in the use of substance. It can be, um, and they can internalize a lot of the negative thoughts that they're having um, either. So they may self-harm or harm others. Um, there's a lot of blaming of the self, feeling guilty, um, being feeling the feelings of depression, anxiety, um, not being able to manage those feelings. They may not even get out of bed. They may not even want to leave their home because their home is safe versus going out into the world and things are unpredictable. So there's just some of the symptoms of trauma and it could probably just go on and on. <laughs> That's a long list. Um, yes. Another question, have women of color shared how different their experience with a white OBGYN is versus a black OBGYN? Have you heard stories um, about what that looks like if people, sh women shared those stories? Um, I have read some articles where women talked about their experience of, with a, a white obstetrician of not feeling heard, like kind of like what I've already talked about, not feeling heard, um, that they have their own way of working and it just has to be in the, the way of working is based on their interests and not the interests of their client, which is a woman of color. Um, also, I've seen some videos about certain groups that focuses on women of color who are midwives that um, it's, they open it up to make it more of a relationship of how, how can we work together so that you can have the birth that you want. 
And there's lots of different videos from different organizations that focus on like what they're doing as, as midwifery um, in terms to pretty much um, combat the disparities of you know, educating women as well as making sure that we are, the, the um, midwives are being advocates for them and explaining through the whole process. Cause a lot of um, times it's not explained or as well as providing um, low cost care for women of color who may not have resources to go to obstetrician, not even their primary care. So yeah, I have an acquaintance um, who has three children. First one was delivered by a white doctor. Second was delivered by a South Asian. And the third was delivered by a midwife. She said, hands down, the midwife experience was the best. Mm -hmm. She said the relationship, because they have the time, they're not constrained mm -hmm. by insurance. Exactly. They're not constrained. That's, that's part of what a midwife does is you build that relationship and she had a home birth, but you build that relationship, right? And I think that's the biggest thing. She said, even the South Asian doctor who she had, um, she was taught in a white medical school. So even with cultural competency, that's still lacking because yeah. of the fact that there's limited time and your education, your medical school is predominantly white. So that's what you, you're taught through that white lens. So for her, the midwife experience was hands down the best. Yeah. And I even reflect on my own experience because I initially started to go to my OB. Granted, my OB was a black woman, but she only spent 15 to 20 minutes with me and that was it. And I decided to transfer care because I'm like, I, I need more than <laughs> what she's given me. And I went to a birth center where they spent an hour, an hour and a half and answered all my questions versus what Obi did. Right. Um, so just a little time check. We're at uh, 10 minutes to the hour. So it's 12.50. We typically try to wrap up around one o'clock. Um, so I don't know what that means for your presentation, but if anyone has any other questions, uh, unmute or pop them into the chat. Um, any final thoughts, words? You've got Sultana? Um, I have some resources I'm willing to share. So let me be fabulous. So these are just some um, websites, pretty much their research is on um, the legacy of slavery. I didn't go in depth into it because it's just very expansive. It talks about the experimentation of slaves. Um, it talks about how um, mental health and the health of infant care is impacted. Um, the next two articles, uh, well, one is a webinar. Um, there's several webinars from that um, website that talks about different aspects of maternal care and racism. Um, this one's an anti-racism um, developmental practice. So if you want to provide anti-racist care for your clients and look through that lens, um, that's a great article to read. There's several podcasts that talks about race in America and what it's like to be a woman of color from different ethnic groups. Um, and this one is just another one that talks about um, different podcasts. And these are some books. Oh, there we go. These are some books I highly recommend. So when we talk about race, oftentimes people feel uncomfortable with the idea of talking about race and the idea that they may be racist or develop or come from a family who is racist. Um, but in order to grow and develop, we have to be able to be uncomfortable because race is not comfortable. It's not comfortable for the women of people of color that experience it. Um, and to be able to be kind of an advocate, you need to be able to dig deep into your own background as well as your perception of the world. But again, these are just some books. Um, some of them is a little bit controversial in terms of race, but it does um, give a different side. And that's all I got in terms of resources. <laughs> um, Sultana, maybe you can email both those uh, resources to us. And when we post this out on a replay, we can add that in the comment section so people can re refer to them if they need to and want to. Perfect. Um, any other questions, thoughts? 
I have some thoughts. It's been a yeah. very active discussion. Um, I think, uh, you know, first, this has been amazing. So thank you for being our guest. And, you know, everyone, I appreciate there's just such rich conversation always going on here. And it's, it's just a blessing. But, you know, having worked in healthcare and also sitting on a board for a nonprofit uh, community health center, some of the things that you touched on are very familiar to me, very familiar that we've seen in the Black community, other women of color, high no-show rates to appointments not being involved in care, mm -hmm. no integrated care. So I loved when you touched on those pieces as well as the education. If you're not educating your patients and that goes for anyone, but if you're not educating them, how can they be a part of the solution? And how are you mm -hmm. really including them in their care? When I worked at the hospital, even it would be like conversations would be going on around patients and you're like, include them in those conversations. So this is just, I learned so much. And when you walk through those disparities, I like, I'm still over here, like, wow, it's, you know, it's unfortunate, but that's why these conversations are important. So um, I appreciate your time and sharing these resources. Yep, no problem. So we have one last question here. It says, this issue is so huge and needs to be heard by so many more people. I have been one of them. How can we do this? So how can we multiply Sultana's presentation by a thousand? What can we do yes. as, as everyone here is there a call to action? Is there something that people in this group now can do to move this conversation forward? Well, first, doing your own work and understanding what, how you, your world is um, perpetuating this racism, a stereotype, and discrimination that's happening. Also, talk with your colleagues about this presentation and what you've learned and how you're gonna use what you learn to impact the people you serve. So I think with a lot of things that we've been talking about on this series, it's all about starting that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, it's a matter of saying, you know, hey, what, this last Friday or today, we, I, I sat in on a great series that talked about, you know, our guest speakers spoke about racial disparities in the prenatal and, post and postpartum world. And here are some of the things that I talked about put it out on social media. Um, I think even finding organizations that support mm -hmm. the postnatal postpartum period, such as PSI, Postpartum Support International, or if you're local to Virginia, Postpartum Support Virginia, mm -hmm. um, getting involved with those organizations. It's a matter of really being involved, getting the education and then spreading it out to your communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Simon, this is Demetria. I guess I turned my camera on for a second. It's not trying to be seen today, but hello. You're beautiful, <laughs> girl, please. <laughs> um, and, and I would also say for those of us who are Black women and South Asian women and Black South Asian women, mm -hmm. we need to have these conversations in our own community as yes, well about um, being... Um, First of all, releasing ourselves of the trauma, the history, the mythology that we also perpetuate because, you know, we have our own baggage from that history, right? Mm -hmm. That we carry with us every day. And so releasing ourselves from that. And <clears throat> I think one of the, um, the other big things is, you know, um, you know, really supporting each other in that advocacy for ourselves as patients. Um, because we see in the numbers that regardless of your socioeconomic status, regardless of your level of education, you are still being, you're not being treated as you should as a human being showing up, mm -hmm. right? And so we cannot um, be ashamed or um, fearful to just advocate for what we deserve as a human being. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, and we need the others in the expanded community to support us in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I even think of my own culture, like first telling them that I am going into the field of psychology. They're like, what? You're not being a doctor? <laughs> so educating them on like, well, we as a culture are suffering. Um, and we're not having these crucial conversations about our feelings and we're like, 
pretty much burying it in hope it doesn't arise, um, but it does <laughs> in our everyday life. Yeah, and even talking to our children, um, my mm -hmm. both my children, my 16-year-old and my 10-year-old, they both know that I'm a survivor of postpartum depression and anxiety. I talk about it on their birthdays. I talk about it because while it's their birthday, it was my experience, exactly. right? And so it is part of the story where, I mean, it's, it's a tradition that we do. I talk about from the minute I went into labor and then I build up. So my son is like, you know, 48 hours, we're celebrating his birthday because mommy was in labor for 48 hours with him. Yeah. <laughs> but I talk about it, right? And so they, for them, it's a normal conversation. Mm -hmm. They are, the idea of stigma behind it is nothing. They get it. They were like, yep. And they will say, oh yeah, my son says I'm mommy's first postpartum, her PPD baby. And he, he proudly says that I'm mommy's PPD baby, postpartum depression baby, right? Mm -hmm. So it's talking to our children, especially our daughters and our sons, because our sons, the hope is they're going to have partners. They need to be aware of it. They need to know what's happening. So it's those conversations at home and in our communities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So thank you, everyone. This was fantastic. We're going to stay on for another few minutes unrecorded. Thank you, Sultana. This was a lot to think about and a lot to digest. Um, but thank you for being here and sharing the star startling stats with us and bringing it to the forefront of the conversation. Yeah, That's I think no just, problem. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yes. um, I think just a couple things before we officially wrap. Um, there's just you know a couple comments that I think are worthy of sharing, and then I want to share a couple of resources just um, for those of us who are live in Team Replay. Um, so there's a comment about the Latinx community needing to reckon with dismissal of women and taboo around mental health. So I think we see that. I mean, we see that in the Black community too, and other communities. So it starts, as Demetria said, and you shared Sultana within the community. Um, and the person said, I learned to ask for something from a doctor, and if they say no or dismiss. Um, then I make, I ask them to note my chart that I asked for that. Um, and they tend to change real quick, right? We know there's a whole compliance and patient care and all of those things that are tied to whole that. system. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone's wanting to know too, and we can talk about this after, but um, if you're available to speak in a front of a larger group of women, I think that's important to share while we're still recording so that our folks who watch after um, can, can join too and hear, hear that. Of course. Yep. Wonderful. We'll make sure I can put my email in the chat too. Yeah. Perfect. And we'll, make sure, we'll make sure when we post the replay to put those contact, your contact information in there. Definitely. I did in the chat also put the YouTube channel. So I think most of you who have been with us before um, know where that is, but um, put that in the chat and we have been posting that um, as well online for that. So I'll make sure that that happens again as well. And then, you know, just thank you for your time. Thanks for sharing all these resources and we will see you all um, next Friday for an unrecorded session. So we won't be recording, but we still welcome everyone to come in and join us. So Thanks, everyone, for Thank joining. Thank you, everyone.